Okay, guys. Week three. Uh, it's to be a shorter, uh, shorter um, slides, because you guys had your quiz today. So um, this will we'll cover week three and week four next week. Mm hmm. All right, let's get to it. International contracts. Okay. So international contract guys, very simple, right? It's just a contract that is put through by two companies that are, or two countries that are, uh, sorry, two companies or two parties that are in different countries. They put them together in order for them to come together or in order for them to sell product or services or whatever. They put this international contract together. So basically it's a legal, legally binding agreement between parties based in different countries in which they are obligated to do or not to do certain things. Okay, international contracts may be written in a formal way. Uh, most businesses create contracts in writing to make uh, the terms of agreement clear. <laughs> Often seeking legal counsel when drawing important contracts. So basically, um, it's a legal, international contracts are just legal agreements that uh, bind the two parties together and they usually use a lawyer to draft up these legal contracts. So, Contracts can cover all aspects of international trade. All of the most used are the ones right there, right? So you got the sales contract, distribution contract, agency contract, sales representative contract, supply contract, manufacturing services, strategic alliance, joint contract, franchise contract. Guys, this is basically the ones that are used the most, okay? And if you look at them, it's very straightforward, right? Like, let's just say that you have a contract to uh, manufacture, uh, or let's just say you're using a company in China to manufacture your, your goods to ship back to Canada so you can make whatever product you're making. You would have a manufacturing contract for China. Okay. Sales representative contract means you are a you sign a you sign a sales representative contract for a company in China, you're selling their products in China. Um, what else? Let's see, you have a supply contract. So you have a contract to supply, supply, you know, let's say you have a company here in Canada and you're supplying material to the U.S., you would have a supply contract. Sale contract is if you're purchasing something, right? So all these are all different contracts. So some fraud. There's a lot of fraud that goes on in the world, obviously, as we all know. Um, there's also fraud that goes on in international contracts. So all parties in commercial transactions should be aware of potential for fraud. Um, in some cases, the parties you negotiate with may not even be aware of the liability they pose. Okay, so sometimes the people that you're doing business with don't even know how much of a risk they are to your business or to themselves. So fraud int int intentionally deceiving other another party. Okay, so fraud means you're basically you're or someone's trying to deceive you or someone's trying to take something from you uh, unlawfully is a criminal offense under common law and civil violation under civil law. While companies claim transparency or on the surface may seem safe, failing to fully investigate the party you are contracting with is an invitation for fraud. So you really have to watch out. Like, you know, life is all about, life's about, uh, you know, you, you would hope that life is about every, everyone is right and everyone's trustworthy and all that stuff. But realistically, we know life's not like that. There's a lot of scam artists out there. There's a lot of fraudsters. There's a lot of, really, the biggest thing with good people is that they're lazy. Laziness is is literally the number one reason, I believe, for fraud, for cutting corners, because people just don't wanna do the work that's necessary, right? So they'll cut corners, they'll cheat, they'll lie, just because they're too lazy to do the work, the actual work, okay? That's basically how fraud comes into play right you have people who are some are just lazy want to cut corners some just don't want to pay the extra money or put in the extra time so they'll commit some stuff on the side so they can get things uh moving or whatever basically long story short there's a lot of fraud that goes on in international contracts you have to be very careful with the people that you do business with due diligence okay basically what due diligence means is a thorough investigation or audit of all matters that are re uh, relevant to an agreement between potential contracting parties. So due diligence before and during negotiations is the best way to limit the financial loss, reputa reputation diminishment, civil tort, like a civil lawsuit, or litigation, and in some instances bankruptcy that can lead that can result from fraud. You know, there's a lot of companies 
that go through this type of stuff, okay? I know a guy, a young guy actually, he was 15 years old, and um, he what he built, he had a, he's a pretty, very smart kid. He built, um, he built a business and then he was, he made a, he made a, a good amount of money. I think he made around $15,000 from that business. He then took that $15,000 and asked to borrow from his dad and his brother another $30,000. So he had $45,000, $50,000 roughly in total of cash. And he wanted to start a new business, which was buying uh, car parts and reselling car parts. Ended up, you know, getting into a contract with someone, paid them all this money, and they took his money and disappeared. So as a 15-year-old kid, he got burned. He got burned completely because he didn't do his due diligence. Due, due diligence means you're actually, before you sign a contract, you do everything to figure out who the company is. Um, you look at all their records. You make sure that they don't have any lawsuits. You make sure you look at their financial records if possible. You make sure you talk to everybody there. Make sure you do your due diligence, right? You see if they actually have a manufacturing plant. You visit the manufacturing plant. You get everything figured out. If something, if your gut is telling you that it's the wrong thing, you should probably just go with your gut, okay? So, um, let's see. For an answer, um, you, you know, you guys will see a lot of, uh, if you guys watch Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, You'll see that a lot of these companies come in and they get offers. Let's say Mark Cuban or um, who else? Mark Cuban or you got uh, Herjavec, right? Or you have um, Kevin O'Leary, right? You have all these guys. They offer people um, money for their, like they, they offer them investments into their business. But it's always due. It's always, it, it's only ever... Um, they only ever really give the money after the show, after they do the due diligence on the company, which means they look at the company from head to toe, their financial statements, their assets, their inventory, their liabilities, if they've ever been sued, their lawsuits, their cash on hand, everything. So yes, in the show, they say we'll give you the money, but all of it is only done after they do their due diligence. Okay. Um, unless an uncovered risk is so substantial as to be a deal broker, ne negotiations are a way to work through issues towards a successful contract. Okay, so negotiating. Negotiating with your client is, um, or your partner, overseas partner or whoever, international partner, is the best way to minimize any issues that may come up. As with other areas of negotiations, due diligence can be an increased challenge in the international international contracts because of language barriers, right? I was just going to get to that. Language barriers are a huge issue. Um, corporate business cultures, cultures are a huge issue as well. National rules and distance, right? It's very tough. Like if you're working from here and you're working out in India, let's just say that I was using a, I was trying to come up with a website for my company, right? And I used a company out in India to do the job. It would be extremely difficult for me to get in touch with the people who are in charge or something happens for me to get in touch with them I can't just show up to their office like for example over here if I gave someone some money to do some work and they didn't do a good job or something was happening and they didn't get my work done I could show up to their office and say where is the guy who said he didn't do my work I need my money back or hire a lawyer send them a letter Boom, hit him with a lawsuit. You can't do that when someone's in, in uh, working out of India. It's very tough. It's very tough to do that when you have a person, a company working out of India. So that's why you have to do your due diligence, right? You gotta see the company, make sure who the company is, and if they're the right company or they're not the right company. And there's a lot of things, right? But you gotta look at the company inside and out. So how do you fix fraud? In international contracts so basically you acquire expertise right so let's just say that you are trying to do business in India hire a, a consultant a business an Indian business consultant right who handles foreign affairs who handles foreign contracts employee letters of credit and secure payment methods so letters of credit basically you're taking 
it's letters of credit means that you let's say the contract's worth a hundred thousand dollars what a letter of credit does is it's with a bank so you take that you take that money and you put it in a bank you put it in a holding account in a bank now no one can touch that money the bank has control of that money the only time the bank releases that money to you is when you meet all the documentations okay so if all your documentations are completed and you send it in the bank approves it, the customer approves all that that's the only time the money gets released but letter of credit is it shows that the, cu the customer has the funds okay the customer has the money um, place requirement clauses in contracts right so you have to just basically uh you have to you have to put in requirement contract clauses and contracts so you have to just show them exactly what you require be aware of current trends and then limit technical and physical security access so basically just you got to keep your um you got to keep people out by uh making sure hackers don't hack your information and stuff like that okay guys so bribery <clears throat> Bribery happens all the time, guys. You see it all the time in different um, different countries, um, and you see it because uh, you know there's a lot of corruption in different governments and and uh, businesses and a bunch of stuff like that. So let's we'll just get into what bribery is. So basically, it's the act of promising, giving, receiving, or agreeing to receive money or some other item of value with the corrupt aim of influencing a public official in the discharge of his official duties. Basically what you're saying is you're paying off. Like let's say a company pays off a politician in order to tell in order for that politician to put in a law that states something that benefits that company. So if something benefits that company, the company's making a ton of money off of it, they're gonna give some of that money to the to the official and that's called bribery. It's typically punishable as a felony um, so basically is when money has been, has been offered or promised in exchange for a corrupt act okay so that's bribery it's a lot of bribery that goes on in international business guys a lot of bribery um, basically what your um, basically what bribery is is archetypal example of a corporation engaging unethical behavior several problems can be attributed to business bribery first it's obviously illegal Second, the rules and regulations that are circumvented by bribery often have a legitimate public purpose. The corporation will be subverting local social interests, right? So, um, bribery is usually it affects the general general public because you're you're bribing politicians to do stuff to to the government, which affects people who are under that government. And third, giving bribes and provoke a culture of corruption in the foreign country. You see this in Africa, Pakistan, India, all these places, corruption is very high. There's a lot of bribery going on. Uh, fourth, considering laws such as U.S. foreign corrupt practices, bribery is illegal not only in the country, but also in corporations home country. And the corporation that is formally accused or convicted of illicit behavior may suffer a serious public relation backlash. So it's not seen as a good thing. If anyone if any top official from your company accepts a bribe and then it gets made public very very bad for uh, very very bad for your public um, your public image so uh, for example there was uh, when I was working in Quebec I was trading commodities the the plant that was owned um, the plant was owned by the Malaysian government and what ended up happening was uh, we started to learn a lot about the stuff that goes on in, in the Malaysian government. One of them was that there was this Malaysian billionaire who offered some diamonds to some people in order to get business. In order to, he offered some diamonds to some women. Um, and speculation it was Miranda Kerr she's a Victoria's Secret model so she got some diamonds from a very wealthy politician the only issue was this politician was getting money from from in by doing you know by doing corrupt things as in he was getting it from the government he was stealing money from the government 
So here's a politician stealing money from the government and using that money to buy diamonds for a Victoria's Secret model. Long story short, he got caught and it was a very, very horrible situation. Tips on drafting international contracts. Just guys go through this, right? This is very easy stuff, improved drafting. So do a lot of versions. <clears throat> if you're making up an international contract, just do a lot of versions of the contract till you get the right one. Um, avoid using hidden messages. Um, make make the messages easy that are hard to understand. So if something's difficult to understand, just make it easy. Use plain English. Attention to the contract, terms of the contract, use proper grammar, search and remove ambiguity. So pretend you're your worst enemy and go through your contract and see if there's anything that can alter or anything that can be used against you in your own contract. So go through your own contract and see, okay, my worst enemy will look at this and say, blah, 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 blah. This is why this contract is null and void. So make sure you go through all of it. Avoid colloquialism. Basically, don't don't use words as ain't, gonna, y'all, bamboozled, like stuff like that. Don't use stuff like that. That's stupid. Uh, do not try to include everything and then eliminate words or phrases with, with multiple meanings. Okay, so <clears throat> those are some tips on drafting national contracts. Now, what are procurement contracts, guys? It's just like a sales contract. It's just something, it's just a contract that you use to purchase. It's just a purchasing contract. You guys can go over this by yourselves. Uh, I'll ask this in the quiz, so make sure you read all of it. But basically, procurement contract is a contract instead of a sales contract where you're where you're selling something. Procurement contracts where you're buying something. And basically, that's the end of slides. I will post an international sales contract template to Google Classroom as well, so you guys can go over and understand the terms, regulations, and structure and stuff like that. It's very important. Um, so for you guys to get an understanding of what an international, typical international sales contract looks like. Alright guys, I'll see you in the next week.